So Imperator Rome's 1.5 Menander update dropped suddenly with only a day's warning on the 11th of August, and the update focuses on several reworks. Culture, Republic government types, and a change to trade and commerce income. Now, as you can guess by the name of this video, this really is the last nail in the coffin for me. I feel like the game is just becoming more unfun with each update, and I feel like they're focusing on the wrong aspects, so... I guess I've just come to terms with the fact that it's not for me anymore, so I thought I'd do one last video on the game before I'll likely move on to Crusader Kings 3 in a couple of weeks, which to me is looking really great so far, as I pointed out in a recent video. So in this one, I'm going to go through some of the major features in the new update pretty quickly, and then I'm going to give my suggestions for what I think Paradox should focus on for Imperator Rome, a sort of priority list for getting the game back on track. And you might think, well, the game's doing just fine, we don't need your input, but it's really not. The last update has been met with more negative reviews recently, and the overall reviews are barely scraping the 50% mark. The player base falls off faster with each update, and this is after the game has received numerous free weekends. To compound this, the crazy thing is the biggest mod for the game, the Bronze Age, was given access to Crusader Kings 3 early by Paradox, and now they're moving the entire project to that game instead. So it's looking really hopeless for Imperator, from my perspective. So, let's take a look at the three main features that arrived in the 1.5 update. First is the culture rework. The premise of the culture update is that you're now able to maintain multiple cultures instead of just assimilating everyone into whatever your dominant culture is. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, it's to keep your pops happy, which prevents unrest and it prevents a potential rebellion. So before we start, it's worth mentioning that a new pop type has been added called the Noble. Noble pops are a tier above citizens and basically produce more research and money in the form of trade routes, which we'll get to later. You now have two types of culture, either integrated or non-integrated. An integrated culture basically means that it's accepted in your society and that the pops who belong to that culture can promote all the way up to Noble. In the new culture screen, you can now actually set a limit for how far along that social class a pop can promote, as well as passing decisions to give them different rights. The decisions are broken into different categories. You get different decisions if they're in the same broad culture group, or if they're not, or if they're integrated already, or if they're not. Generally, most of them are just there to make the pops happy and to make it so that if you do choose to integrate them, it happens much faster. But you can also get decisions that grant independence, creating vassal states out of a particular culture group in certain provinces. It's pretty good. There's a decent amount of options and it gives you a lot more ways to interact with the culture, although it is quite overwhelming. I won't lie, I'm still trying to fully wrap my head around it, but generally I think it's an improvement to the system that was there, at least from a gameplay perspective. What's a bit weird to me is that thematically it doesn't really make that much sense. So let's say you start a playthrough as Rome and you grant the Mesapian Pops, who are part of the Illyrian culture group, the right to intermarry with Romans. And then maybe even you begin the full integration of their culture, allowing them to work whatever job they like, thus reaching any social class or status. This now means that Mesapian Pops will no longer assimilate to being Roman. They'll stay forever Mesapian. And you can manage their happiness now in other ways with decisions. For gameplay, this works. It potentially takes a load of time off your hands having to convert pops, speeding up the overall process of keeping everyone happy. But it is a bit weird generally, as in real life, things like intermarriage and citizenship was usually considered Romanization and the faster spreading of the Roman way of life. So thematically, it's sort of backwards. It might have been interesting to do it the opposite way, where people don't assimilate unless you give them rights and laws and citizenship. You know, adding a whole culture to the bread dole, for instance, could be pretty taxing. There's a reason you wouldn't want to give them citizenship. But it might come with the, you know, the offset of you actually get to integrate their culture faster. I don't know, to me it seems more plausible and interesting, but nevertheless, the system is here and it's fine. So how would you actually use this? What's a good example of where you would need it in gameplay? My example of the Mesapiens was kind of just to explain it. You wouldn't typically use this on a small group of 10 or 20 pops, but maybe a few hundred if they're in one group. And the reason for this is that the more cultures you accept and you integrate, the more unhappy each of them become, as each one gets a negative 5% happiness effect. So accepted multiculturalism ultimately will create unrest if you have too much of it, at least according to Paradox. You can revoke citizenship, though, if you wanted to just start assimilating them again, however. So it could be a temporary thing. You just kind of put them on hold, give them citizenship, and then just revoke it when you're ready to actually deal with converting them. Uh, which, again, is pretty backwards, but there you go. Now, where integration and laws can be effective is if you know you're going to go to war with a certain culture that's very numerous, you can start establishing those laws for your inevitable conquest. Then the pops you acquire will be a bit more accepting of you. The drawback to this is that while you're at war, they actually are quite unhappy that you're fighting a nation of their culture. 
Now, even though you accept and integrate cultures, you still always assimilate to your primary culture. So ultimately, you could kind of ignore the feature if you wanted to, but now you have the option to try and at least improve the happiness over large groups very quickly, instead of waiting for those assimilations to take place. I would say this is the best part of the update. So, moving on, the next big overhaul is the Republic Government Type Overhaul. Previously, Republics had five parties within them, the Civics, Militarists, Mercantiles, Religious, and Populists. If a member of a party was the ruler, then you'd get a specific benefit from that party. For instance, the Civic Party, if they were in power, you'd get a tax rate benefit, and so on. When you wanted to make a decision about something, whether it be passing a law, going to war, or imprisoning someone, there'd be a little thumbs up or thumbs down next to it, and this would show the breakdown of the seats that showed how the parties felt about the decision. So, for going to war, the militarists were usually in favour, but it depended on how many seats they currently held, whether or not they could actually sway that vote. There would also be many other factors at play that might make the other parties play ball as well, such as having a popular ruler or looking out for the interests of another party, like the religious party might agree to a war if it's against a different religion. If you had a thumbs down, so not enough backing for the decision, then you just couldn't do the action, you weren't allowed. If you had an average backing, you could force the decision through for tyranny, and if you had a positive backing, you could do it without any consequence, and even you might gain or lose seats with the parties who agreed or disagreed. You could also spend stability and suffer tyranny to boost a party directly, as well as do other government actions to endorse different parties. It is quite complicated, and if you don't play the game actively, I can understand how that might have been just a bunch of jargon. Well, let's just talk about how it works now. So now, in 1.5, there's three parties. It's sort of broken down into the aristocrats, known mostly as the oligarchs, the conservatives, known as the traditionalists, and the democrats, who are just called democrats. The naming is slightly different if you play as Rome and some minor differences to values, but the mechanics are the same. So, this can get a little tricky, so try to stick with me. Each of these three political parties has their own approval rating for you as a ruler, as well as a certain amount of seats in the Senate known as control. This control will give a weight to their approval, and it'll feed into your overall average approval as a ruler. So a party with little control, but high approval, won't count for much towards your overall approval. If you have less than 60% approval, on the average, you can't do any major act in the game without taking a tyranny hit. The lower your approval, the bigger the tyranny hit if you force something through. It doesn't matter if it's waging a war, getting an ally, improving relations, passing a law, or any other thing. If you want to do it, you'll take a tyranny hit. Now for those unaware, tyranny lowers the loyalty of your generals, and it also now lowers approval of the democrats, but increases approval for the oligarchs. Depending on the control, this could be a bad thing or a good thing. So straight away, the system is really simplified from how it was before because now parties don't care for their own interests, they kind of have this hive mind approval that they contribute to. And arbitrarily, it's just decided that if it's lower than 60, you're forcing things through. It's really frustrating to play like this. You can barely do anything to get to 60% as doing things means lowering approval and taking tyranny. So as an example, political parties now have their own agendas. They want you to do things for them. Often it's like passing a law, grant us some holdings, or something to that effect. If you complete their agenda, you'll gain instant approval with them. But often, like really often, they'll ask you to do something like pass a law that lowers their own approval. Here, I'm being asked by the Democrats to pass a law that will piss off the Democrats. So if I do it, they'll get mad and I'll gain tyranny for forcing it through, lowering their approval even more. Here I'm being asked to pass a law that literally all the parties approve of. They all agree that this is good, but because I don't already have their 60% average approval, I'll gain tyranny for doing it, and I'll piss some of them off in the long run. This is a really badly thought out and badly implemented system. There are so many instances where what they ask you to do is at odds with what the party stands for. Nothing really makes sense, and things are just generally broken. For instance, you're supposed to spend manpower to get party approval, you actually gain manpower instead. It's actually literally just not working. As Rome, I found it quite easy to get over 60 approval, and then you can basically just ignore the Senate. But as Massalia and Gortnia, kind of Hellenic city-states, I could barely ever get it to 60 before an election would occur and a new ruler would come in and just lower it back down. It's worth noting that when you start a game, you start with just 50% approval. So imagine playing as a small one city state 
and you're not able to even form an ally or improve relations without taking tyranny hits, which often lowers approval further in the long run. So not only is it tough, it's just not fun being told you just can't do anything or you're constantly taking a negative every time you do something. Elections are another mess. Typically, high prominence and family prestige feeds into these electoral results, but it's not really working anymore and I've no idea how to affect it. I tried for a very long time, but couldn't prevent someone from getting elected, even though they had a smaller political party, they had less prominence, less wealth, and less prestige than the guy I wanted to get in. My guy was of age, he hadn't ruled before and had the bigger party behind him, but he never got voted in. I worked hard to smear the reputation of the first candidate, give my guy a good job, make sure his family and his political party were happy, and I just got nothing for it. And it's not that I can't figure things out, I had a long-running Carthaginian Republic Let's Play on Very Hard, where I manipulated the Senate and I got certain people in, and sometimes it would work and sometimes it was a struggle. I eventually got a dictator in place and turned it into an empire. It was pretty tricky, but it was fun to manage because it always made sense what was happening. Sometimes it doesn't work out, which is fine, it does, it's not like I always have to get my guy in, but at least I should know why. I'm currently lost as to what the hell is happening for these elections. So generally, I'm just not, I can't be a fan of the system. I think republics were far better when the different parties actually voted on the things they wanted with each decision. I do really like the concept of political parties having their own agendas that you can try to complete, but right now they make no sense and they're mostly irrelevant stuff. It would make much more sense for a party to give you a mandate on election and if you fulfilled it, you'd gain the approval. Regardless of all this, the whole thing just doesn't make sense anyway because rulers shift so often I'm not sure how approval kind of translates from one to the other when their parties are also shifting. So, I don't know, I'm at a loss for it, really. So that's Republics for me. Good idea to add agendas, I think, but bad idea to reduce the parties and give them an average approval instead of have their own individual wants. It's sloppy implementation with many bugs and agendas that don't work and an overly convoluted election system that seemingly has hidden values. And that's it. So the last thing to touch on for the update is trade. Trade goods now have their own individual value. Previously, it didn't matter if the trade good was stone or gold or whatever. It was worth the same because the value was actually based on the amount of citizens in the province it was received in. The idea being that the citizens are the ones generating the commerce value by trading anything. Didn't matter what it was. Now, citizens and nobles don't generate commerce income at all anymore, but instead they generate trade routes. This allows you to import more goods and the goods earn money based on what they are. So it's kind of like an extra step involved but it does play the same. It does, however, make more sense, so I do like it. Though they could probably change the name of the word trade routes to trade value. It's weird to see a citizen made 0.57 trade routes, especially as they're just imports anyway. So that's it for the update. So make of it what you will. I don't like it. I really hated the update before this, and I've lost pretty much total interest in the game since 1.4. But here's what I would do if I was to take over the game. Here's my priority list of what I think Imperator needs to focus on. I'm not sure why Republics were reworked. I thought they were totally fine. I felt the same for culture and religion. It's like, yes, eventually these could probably be handled and improved, but there are much bigger issues with the game that need to be addressed first before then figuring out things that are basically fine. So let's start. Number one is a viable playstyle for playing as a subject. Currently, the game's biggest issue is diversity in playstyle. There's three government types across the entire game, making all the nations play and feel very similar. The governments of the same type share the same laws and offices, the same electoral models and government interaction buttons. There's nothing different about it. So my first priority would be to create a new way to play. Vassals are extremely limited right now. Taking Athens, for example, who start as a vassal of the Antigonid Kingdom, there's nothing you can do for a few key reasons. The biggest of which is that if the Antigonid Kingdom goes to war, which they always do about one year in, you cannot declare independence, you can't wage war on them, and you can't defect to the other side. You just have to sit there and wait for the war to be over. And if you try to help them and play your part as a good vassal, you're also often penalized for having good relations with your overlord as high relations means they can integrate you, which they typically do. And it's very, very fast the smaller you are. Now you can build up relations during peacetime with someone and ask to switch to them and be their underling, but it doesn't really give you a viable way to actually play. Ideally, a new playstyle would allow you to send delegations to your overlord, get some benefits from them maybe, 
give you some intrigues to betray them or seek the support of others if you're planning to rise up. I don't see why you couldn't have a specific job in your offices for a character who deals with your overlord. With good relations, maybe you could do a war council proposing that you expand with the help of your overlord, or something like staying tall allowing you to develop robust trade and give them gold in exchange for pops or something to that effect. So number two, unique buildings for different cultures. Right now, all empires share the same set of buildings in a city and the same ones in settlements. If a nation were to conquer another, the buildings just stay the same. Temples built by Zhang Zeng are just used fine by Bactria. There's no flavor to anything as a result. There's about 20 major culture groups in the game, and I'd love to see even just a few unique buildings for each culture. It again would make it feel like a different playstyle playing in different parts of the world. There's so many effects in the game that there's no shortage of what you could make a building do. You could even do some province-wide buildings for cities where all the territories in a province get the benefit, like a farmer's market, which gives less trade routes maybe than a regular market, but increases the output of all the farms in the province so you can specialize places a bit more. Just something to make you step into an empire for the first time and go, oh cool, I've got some new options here with these guys. Number three, unique units for different cultures. So similar to buildings, Imperator Rome doesn't have any unique units. It just has unit types. All the changes to units are modifiers based on technology and traditions. It's pretty lame because it means that a Greek hoplite unit is the same as a legionary cohort when the game starts because they're both classed as heavy infantry and only through some traditions that you can choose later on will they diverge at all. It'd be great if not all units were just 1,000 men, but instead had different numerical values to reflect their actual sizes. Not only would it be nice for historical flavor, but for gameplay it would add a lot of diversity. You could have large 1,000-man units for a lot of tribes, but small units of a few hundred for professional soldiers. Morale and damage obviously then would need to be addressed too. It's a pretty big overhaul. This would allow you to have much more interesting army compositions and allow for unique region-based units. An auxiliary system would allow nations like Rome to recruit Iberian cavalry, and these types of units could take longer to gain loyalty to their commanders or something. There's so much potential there, but I understand it is that one is quite a major overhaul. Number four, unique technologies. You get the idea, technologies that no other culture gets. A technology that does something, like allows a new law, a new building, a new unit, anything but a modifier please number five rework power and loyalty i hate the new loyalty system i truly believe it was better before loyalty should be a trending number that goes up or down given a set of circumstances and occasionally has an instant jolt given an event just like it was before remove all the loyalty technologies they don't make a lick of sense then rework power to also trend up or down so when someone does lose their job they get a jolt to the power lowering it but they still retain some as it falls off over time. This means you can't remove problem characters without a consequence. Families also shouldn't be scorned based on how many jobs they have. Instead, it should be based on their prestige relative to the other families. A neglected family will have low prestige. This should scorn them. You'll have to give them good jobs to give them good amount of prominence to feed into their prestige. Right now, you can give a guy one unit to lord over and this just triggers as a job and keeps his family happy. It's ridiculous. Number six, trade that travels. Right now, trade is an instant agreement between nations diplomatically to just receive a buff. Trade needs to travel, not physically, but have a physical route on the map. The routes generate on agreement the same way a route is generated to click an army to move from one place to another. So it's not that taxing on the game to do this. The route doesn't need to redraw unless a war ends or a territory is shifted around. The reason for this is the ability to allow you to interrupt trade to be able to raid and to blockade empires. Number seven, mercenaries. Mercenaries should have a sort of diplomatic range. You shouldn't be able to pull them from all over the world and they should use the average tech of the alliance rather than the best tech. A fun idea is to allow city-states to offer up their armies as mercenaries in return for gold. They can maybe get a little bit of a manpower benefit while this is happening to ease those losses. So that's my priority list for what I would do and what I would work on and in what order before I even think about touching culture, religion, republics or any of the established things that basically already work. In my mind, the game is lacking real content. Missions are not content to me, but units, buildings, unique mechanics, that stuff, that's the stuff that makes me want to play as different nations and see different things. 
Then, from a business perspective, you could also have a decent DLC model. You could do the Iberia pack, which adds units, buildings, missions, government nuances, like different office positions, maybe a unique trade good or two that works with some of the buildings. Like a real big expansion pack that gives not one way to play, but a few different variations for the Celt-Iberians and their subcultures. Maybe then throw a few out there for free and you're golden. Anyways. This is never going to happen. Essentially, I want the game to become more of an empire builder, but the game is stuck being a modifier simulator. Everything is the exact same, but modifiers change everything. And it's so fundamentally rooted in the design, I'm not sure that's ever going to change. So that's kind of it for me on this game. I tried to love it. I did a let's play. I enjoyed it for what it was, but there's really only one play style in the game. So I guess I'm done. If you want to follow a YouTuber who continues Imperator coverage, Lord Lambert enjoys the game, so shout out to him. I'll be moving on to Crusader Kings 3. Let me know what you think of my ideas, what would you do to help the game, and I'll see you in the next one. Also, join my Discord. We talk about lots of different games there, from Paradox and other strategy games. The links are in the description.